This is your Libertarian Crusaders episode podcast number 16. And today we have a featured guest, Mr. Richard Cheatham. And uh, he has a very interesting tale to tell of many uh, in terms of um, your involvement with uh, motivational speaking in terms of like colonial times, right? <laughs> right, yeah. I speak to all kinds of meetings, groups, conventions, gatherings, uh, anywhere I can make money. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's all for income, but it's it's doing something I think is important. Um, I look at I was a a, a journalist uh, coming out of college uh, hmm. for years uh, at Channel Eight here in Richmond. Uh, that was where I first had a job, and uh, worked there, and then Channel Ten uh, in Roanoke, and wrote for newspapers and this, that, and the other. So I was a purveyor of fake news, and um, <laughs> and uh, I know all about that, and. Uh, then I started a business back in many years ago in 1986, and it was it's a speakers bureau that provides uh, dead people for meetings and events. You know, and the dead people are people who are from history, actual historical characters who did significant things, things that were pivotal and and led us to where we are today, for good or bad. And um, uh, one of the uh, Portions of history that we uh, deal with is the Jamestown period. It's uh, that first successful English colony in North America that was the seed that evolved into the United States of America and really kind of informs us as to who we were, how we became the way we are, again, for good or bad. Uh, this is this year, by the way, uh, 2019 is a 400th anniversary of two significant Jamestown events. And by the way, that's all before the pilgrims at Plymouth Rock. Right. <laughs> this is all before that. Um, and um, I think they came, what, 1620, and Jamestown the, was like 1607. That's correct. Right. Yeah, so 13 years before. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, anyway, in 1619, the first little um, representative government based upon the parliamentary system in England was created for Jamestown and and the common guy basically had a voice more so than he had had before um, and you know this in the Spanish and and French and and other European uh, cultures uh, uh, they didn't have a parliamentary tradition didn't have a Magna Carta and anyway that that started at Jamestown in 1619 also, the um, introduction of the first Africans uh, into uh, English North America took place in 1619. And um, uh, that's a, a, a fundamentally important part of the history as well. And, and the character that I sometimes dress up as and portray, uh, John Rolfe, who was the husband of Pocahontas, um, he uh, had to do with both of those things, the introduction of the parliamentary system, the introduction, uh, the, a report on the arrival of the first Africans. He was also the entrepreneur who um, turned a failing commercial enterprise, the Virginia Company, into a successful, profitable business through tobacco hmm. um, and saved um, the seed that would have died out had the English abandoned and the Spanish or French or Dutch or someone would have dominated North America. Hmm. A country would have resulted, but it wouldn't have had a parliamentary system. Yeah, when did the uh, French settle? Uh, Quebec, I yeah. think. Uh, I believe the date there is 1608, which is only a year after Jamestown, uh, very early. Um, the Spanish, of course, were in the Americas long before that. Um, well, in Florida, so were they in there before Plymouth? Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and the Spanish and the Portuguese also... Um, were uh, active ever since Christopher Columbus, really, in 1492, grabbing this or taking that or establishing colonies here and there. But um, the English, um, their first successful, no, I take it back, let's say unsuccessful attempt to, um, to colonize parts of North America was under um, Sir Walter Raleigh, and that was what we today call the uh, lost colony, uh, Roanoke. Ro yeah, the Indian name Roanoke, down in North Carolina, the Outer Banks of North Carolina, 
today, but in those days they didn't call it North Carolina. There was no North Carolina. It was Virginia from the Atlantic right. to the Pacific, <laughs> from, from what you and I would call uh, uh, Canada down to Florida. That was Virginia. <laughs> Th- that's why I always say, make Virginia great again. And <laughs> make it a super monolithic state. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that early history is so uh, phenomenally uh, important uh, and set so many patterns uh, for us in the early years and it's just not told much uh, in schools they don't teach it well they and they gloss over a topic that you and I were talking about earlier uh, and that's the failure of the common storehouse system mm-hmm. and uh, and its replacement uh, by widespread ownership of private property that was a, a huge shift and and transition from failure to uh, uh, growing success. I'm not saying perfection. I'm saying, you know, growing uh, uh, attempt at survival and happiness. It's funny because I still hear sometimes like people wanted to get together as communes and still coming with the same, you know, to each according to their ability, to each according to their need. Yeah. Uh, and then over time they fail until they revert to like some kind of capitalistic venture. There's some here in Virginia that have done that. Um, Acorn. They have to start selling something. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're in Louisa County, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I don't know yeah. What they're called? But All right. It's always funny how uh, eventually we're going to see in Jacob and Magazine, we're going to see like, um, actually, the United States started out with communism, and it was really the way it was supposed to be. You know? <laughs> well, well, you know, it, it, this really goes back to just fundamental human nature. It, I mean, it. Uh, you have to take it back, you know, and and you you abandon all the. All the definitions that cause so much friction, you know, when in, in our contemporary uh, life we, uh, you know, get in these arguments and so forth, so easy to do these days. But when you just abandon those and you go back to uh, human nature, uh, humans fundamentally want to do two things, and they do them in a, in a basically in a in an order. And the first one is survive. Basic. If you don't commit suicide, you you want to survive. Right. You try, and you know we try in different ways. And the second thing you do, we all do, is be try to be happy. But what's happy for you and you and you and me, it's not identical. And and that's a good thing. It's great that it's not identical. But that's what we all do. And uh, and incentives and disincentives that affect us all and have always affected humans and will always affect humans, uh, they define our actions. You know, our uh, people don't like to be pushed. Right. They don't like to be punched. That's just kind of a common thing. And you can punch people directly or you can punch them indirectly through agents that, that work for you, wearing a uniform or having a badge or, right. or, or, or a title of some kind. Uh, and so humans always react in the same ways. I mean, this is all just human nature. Um, one of the things having to do with this uh, common storehouse idea, the socialist idea, um, causing such problems at Jamestown um, and then the shift to private property is documented by something I brought here. This is a, a friend of John Rolfe's was a guy by the name of Ralph Hammer, H-A-M-O-R. Um, he wrote something, uh, True Discourse of the Present State of Virginia um, till 18th of June, 1614. Well, um, Ralph Hammer uh, talks about this transition, and it's, I mean, talks about um, human nature. Um, I love this part. He says, uh, when our people were fed out of the common store and labored jointly together, glad was he who could slip from his labor or slumber over his task he cared not how. Nay, the most honest of them would hardly take so much True and uh, true pains in a week, as now for themselves they will do in a day. Neither cared they for the increase, presuming that howsoever the harvest prospered, the general store must maintain them, so that we reaped not so much corn from the labors of thirty as now three or four do provide for themselves. You know that's kind of antiquated language, but it it. it it translates to me. I mean, that's human. That's human nature. All right. Um, I think um, Bradford, was he the governor of 
the Plymouth or Jamestown. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and he wrote that, uh, those who believed in communal property after when he came in, after everyone was starving, says, like, this is not working out. He said, they're deleting, de- deluding themselves into thinking they're wiser than God. Yeah. Uh, and there's kind of forced socialism that he kind of writes, uh, about. Um, and then he, uh, does exactly, uh, the opposite. It's like, this is your land. Grow what you need. Uh, he does introduce taxation. You only have to work a month, no more than a month going towards, I guess, the Virginia colony. Um, or if, I don't know if that's pay, paying this, the crown or that's just paying, uh, the company that's chartered this, you know? Yeah. Well, I think there's one interesting thing that, that, uh, struck me as, um, strange. And, and it does, it, it comes up today. And that is, if they learned this at Jamestown, <laughs> Plymouth was following that. Right. So why didn't they know this? But, but if you take that further, well, they knew it a thousand years before this. Right. Right. And they knew it a thousand years before that. And we know it a thousand years into the future. We, we always know that humans will work harder if they expect they will profit proportionate to their labor, work more, eat more, work less, eat less. There's no magic about that. Right. I we think, all know that. Yeah. So why does it keep being brought up? I think one of the problems, kind of looking at the people that kind of came to these kind of colonies, uh, many of them were indentured servants. So I guess if you're an indentured servant, you don't really have more of a, an interest to produce more because you're not going to keep any of that to yourself. In terms of your labor, you don't get to keep much of that. So you're going to try to shirk or avoid uh, job responsibilities as much as you can since you're not able to kind of reap what you're sowing. Yeah. Right. Um, I think that kind of help attribute to some of the problems. Um, and in a way, I guess, you know, that's kind of what created the Industrial Revolution, the abolition of slavery and abolition of these kinds of uh, practices. Um the South probably could have enjoyed all of that if well, that was a that was a hot topic this year, right? Because of Jamestown uh, 20, 2019, and they were going to have this discussion about the beginning of slavery in, in North America, and there were a couple of articles here and there about well, we wouldn't have the economic productivity today that we have without slavery, and their argument almost assumed that slavery was a was a better model and more right. efficient, or more efficient and model, and profitable, rather than actually a, a terrible way to organize labor. You know? Right? <laughs> yeah, you're working against human nature. You know, I mean, humans produce more when they think they're going to benefit. Right. Where Africa, uh, where these slaves were coming from, they already had slaves. So yeah. where are these huge megalithic uh, cities? Yeah. Right. If that's what these things produce, why are they so absent uh, in those regions where these slaves were coming from? Well, well, humans have to learn lessons over and over and over and over and over. I mean, the classic lessons humans uh, have to learn over and over. It's, and it's that cycle you see in history. People talk about history repeating itself. Well, the, the what's behind that is human nature is not. It, it, it's constant. It doesn't change. There's no serious deviation from from human nature over you know the recorded history of mankind. And so, uh, you do the same, you have the same inputs, you get the same outputs, you know, and we change our technology, our, our science, knowledge of science changes, but human nature doesn't. And that's what I like about history and one of the reasons I got into it, trying to figure out why humans do what they do. Well, take a look at, at, at the record of, uh, humans doing things and you see the same cycles. It's just, all the way through there. And I, I think, uh, uh, we who try to, uh, analyze it and look at the simple core of it need to identify those core things, the simple things, you know, not get into politics and argue this and argue this, you know, what policy would work best here and all that. If you get people to the understanding of what human nature is and that humans don't like to be pushed and hurt, <laughs> And they'll, they'll work more and, and be more creative and happier if they're allowed to be peaceful and do whatever the hell they want. Right. Well, that, that's a pretty simple concept. And you don't have to argue politics when you, when you get into that. When I think of like communists today still think that they can kind of warp human behavior. Like in a way they say, uh, you get rid of capitalism, uh, you work as much as you need to, right? They still kind of follow the same kind of principles for the first two years when they were failing and starving as if they can kind of erase, uh, I guess, what 
greed or erase uh, <laughs> great the communist man right that, the yeah. perfect, perfect they, human they, yeah they think right. they they think they can perfect human nature they think they, they can affect it and improve it uh, based upon some model that they've established whether you agree or disagree force. with the model <laughs> we just force you to do it yeah, and it'll yeah. work yeah all we need is more force yeah you know just give me the power to coerce people and I'll, I'll fix the world right. that's their answer it's the constant answer. It's it's always it has always been their answer. It always will be. Yeah. There's no other. In in your experience, when you're speaking to people, what is a major historic fallacy that you encounter among you know when somebody's asking you, well, isn't um, you know, uh, isn't this a horrible system or you know that they came up with in Jamestown or or vis a vis history or whatever you know what. Well, uh, when uh, people come to our presentations uh, with all kinds of illusions, you know, I mean, the, the, you, you never know uh, what you're going to hear next. But uh, um, common illusions are that the, the the Pilgrims were the first permanent English settlement. That's that's a, a big one, and um, and. Uh, the, 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 I think there's a reason for that. I brought a couple of books to, to um, mention. Uh, there's a reason why most Americans think that that issue, that uh, 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 wrong fact is a fact. Uh, uh, the reason that Americans think that is because of a conflict that took place in the 1860s. The winners write the history after the war. And you can look at books that were written in America in the 1850s. Jamestown's all over it. Right. Then you look at books that were written in America on American history in the 1870s, and Jamestown has disappeared, and the Pilgrims have taken... Wait, are you talking about the Civil War? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that war, yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, between that the war. <laughs> and um, a book um, that makes that point, I didn't think of it of it until I read this book right um, it's uh, did Pocahontas save Captain John Smith by uh, Dr. Um, Leo LeMay of uh, University of Delaware he's no longer alive but he was a brilliant guy did a lot of work on Jamestown and on the early colony and so forth and he took he, he wondered that question why do Americans know everything about the pilgrims and they don't know anything about Jamestown and uh, he found out he, he, he found documents written by the leading historians of that period, and, he's, and they made a dis conscious decision that the bad people we will write out and the good people we will write in. Wow. It, this book, the introduction to this book, covers that. So what you're saying is we should sneak over to Plymouth and take their small rock <laughs> <laughs> and plan it here at Jamestown. <laughs> well, well, you know, a, a point that I make as, as a historian uh, relates to my time as a journalist. Um, you know, uh, I've come to the conclusion that history and journalism are identical. A historian and a, and a journalist are identical. The only difference is you're talking about three hours ago. Or three centuries ago. Mm. It's the length of time away. When does news become history? I don't know. History is everything before that. Right. It's all history. And, and, uh, and so uh, there's been deception in, uh, in media, and there's been deception in history forever. The winners tell uh, the story. And here's one of the problems that uh, historians and journalists have when they're dealing with these things is, and I'll, I'll admit these flaws. I, I'm, I'm as guilty as anyone. We don't know everything. Number two, we make mistakes. Number three, we have opinions and preferences. <laughs> and you, you're not going to eliminate that. That, that's just part of that human nature again. That, that's why this is a challenging area. Um, I can be completely factual. I can tell you things that are absolutely documentable um, and, and, and provable that, that happened based on evidence and deceive you by not telling you some of these other facts I know that I chose not to tell you. Right. That's what he's talking about in this book. Did Pocahontas save uh, Captain did, John yeah, Smith? Did Pocahontas save Captain John Smith? It's not necessarily that they, they are not telling you the truth. They just decided not to tell you other truth. It's a fallacy of omission. 
because that's it. <clears throat> right. That's exactly right. That's that's how you do it. Right. <laughs> Leave out certain key facts so you don't get a good picture of the situation. And and the reality is you're never going to get all the facts anyway. Well, right, because you're looking way back in history. And, and so when I do a lecture, or, or let's say I have an hour's time to do a lecture, I did one a couple of days ago, and uh, um, at the end of that presentation, I like to say now, I want to... I want to warn you about what, what, I, what my presentation. You got to be skeptical of me, and I tell them, you know, I don't, I don't know everything. I make mistakes and have a, a, opinions. Yeah. And, and I said, I didn't tell you all I know about Jamestown. I told you what I could tell you in an hour, <laughs> and and I had to choose that based upon what I thought was most important. And if you knew all this stuff, you might choose a different set of facts. But I, my encouragement then is. If you think I'm wrong, go look at the record. Those damn Yankees. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, saw an article recently in uh, local Richmond. I, I like to follow local Richmond news, so I'm curious about your take on the way things have shifted recently. But I saw this article, and it said, uh, CBS Channel 6, Richmond has an eviction problem. What can be done to fix it? And I, I liked how the immediate framing of the issue is it's a problem with eviction. It's not a problem with People just not paying the rent, right? Because if you said Richmond has a rent paying problem, well, you're taking a side one way or the other, and so you've already uh, framed you've already framed the debate. Absolutely right, and I I I think this has to do with the way we humans process information. Uh, you could look at life and the world. Uh, think of it as a, a camera lens. You got a telephoto, and you're very careful. You're looking at lots of small details, very to a, to a high level of of, of degree, uh, and then you look at life with a wide angle lens, and you see how all the little things fit together. But uh, you know, you can live in the world of the wide angle lens, or you can live in the world of the of the telephoto lens. But life requires us to go back and forth. We have to. I mean, the mundane little things that you have to do to live, you know, day to day, eat, you know, right. get up, you know, you, you have to do those things uh, or you just you, you can't process uh, daily life and so forth. But if you get so focused upon the little focused things, um, then you don't see the big picture and how it all fits together in the world. We, we have to go back and forth. And, and back and forth, and I, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember what you said that brought me to think about that. But. Well, just the yeah, the, the oh, yeah, yeah. tendency to focus in <laughs> yeah. on this. It, it, it's problem. the telephoto. You know, you know, they they're gonna um, they're gonna make you focus on it. Uh, you know, don't. It, it's kind of like what a magician does when they want to deceive you. Yeah, so uh, it's like a misdirection. Uh, right. yeah. yeah, look, look at this suspense. shiny object here. Look at here. Look at here. And that. Uh, yeah. Pay attention to that. Look at that. And and with their other hand behind their back. They're doing something that is the important thing. Right. That's the way it works. And that's the way journalism works. That's the way history works. It's the way humans function. Um, you know, it, 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 I believe a journalist or a historian more if they tell me, okay, that's my take on it. Um, I encourage you to look further. Uh, and also, I, I do a bit of writing. And sometimes uh, in my writing, I, I, I start my writing with a caveat emptor. Buyer beware. You know, mm -hmm. here are what my fundamental values are. You don't have to adopt those. I'm just telling you what mine are. And this is the way I process information about the world. But now you'll understand what I'm writing better. Uh, again, you don't have to agree with it, but uh, I'm telling you. And, and I encourage you to ask other people who think they're experts to tell you what their values are, too. Mm -hmm. You know, be honest up front. You know, how do, what are your fundamental basic uh, values? Uh, and the truth. What are, what are you including and excluding? <laughs> so anyway, right. how did your uh, investigation of journalism uh, not just bring you to to do this kind of work, but in a way of was it like going through history that brought you to libertarianism or it, uncovering that? It, it, I think this has been going on in my brain as long as my brain, as long as I can remember my brain doing anything. It started when I was in a high chair. <laughs> as a as an infant and i remember my mom was feeding me some kind of mush and a spoon uh every day i was getting it you know stuck in my face over here every day and then and then on a some occasion she stuck the food food in my mouth over here it, it was it shocked me and i remember um thinking i remember this thought uh 
I didn't verbalize it, didn't tell her, I don't think, but I was thinking, why did the adult do that? What's behind this? <laughs> there's got to be some reason. There's got to be some reason that I'm getting food over here. What's the change? That led me to an interest in history and journalism and, and libertarian ideas. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Yeah. I'm not kidding. I, I track it back to that earliest thought that I can remember. I've always wondered why people do what they do. Your mother took a bite of your pudding, and yeah, so you discover taxation. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I frowned at that point. <laughs> and justice. <Yeah. laughs> what are some uh, libertarian thinkers that uh, you appreciate? Oh, my golly. Um, uh, they're, they're dead ones and they're living ones. Uh, I, when I was, I think my first uh, uh, conscious interest in politics uh, uh, as such or government uh, more focused uh, uh, in human activity was uh, during the Goldwater campaign of 64. I, I kind of paid attention and, you know, this guy was saying some things. He was kind of a heretic, you know, and saying things that the mainstream wasn't saying. And, and it, 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 it brought me to an interest in, in some ideas. And I later found out that uh, Goldwater's uh, speechwriter was a guy by the name of Carl Hess, who I came to meet here in Richmond of all places hmm. and got to know him and, and uh, he became a hero for me. Uh, he wrote the, the article, uh, Death of Politics in Playboy magazine, which was influential in the, those early days. And I was reading uh, that guy right there. Karl Marx. <laughs> <laughs> uh, his twin brother. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, I was re getting into uh, Frederick Bastiat and uh and, and Murray Rothbard and uh did you ever meet any of these people? I did. Yeah. And uh I was uh you know, I was kind of drawn to it like a magnet, you know, like wow, nobody's saying these things. I mean, this is making yeah. sense to me. It just kind of fits together and this human nature thing, it just works. And uh I was able to to meet Rothbard at a uh I I am not a member of any political party, nor have I uh, any desire to ever be a member of any political party, but I did go to a couple of Libertarian Party conventions for one reason or another. Uh, you know, interesting people, and I remember um, uh, um, having been very familiar with Rothbard, and he was there. He was one of the lecturers, and I thought... I gotta talk to this. Wow, guy. they let him speak in one. Pardon? Of them. They let him speak in one of those. Wow, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> things and, have changed. And, 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 and uh, you know, I thought, you know, I'm not around this guy very often. I won't have this opportunity much. So I got to think up a question I can ask him real quick. I won't, I'm not going to take a, a lot of his time up. And so I thought up a question real quick, and I asked him, and he gave me a really good answer. And I said, "Thank you very much." And, I, and that's the only time I actually talked to him. But I've heard him lecture, and and uh, it, it, just a, a, an amazing uh, intellect. I was reading. Uh, I was doing a lot of this early reading and study while I was a cadet at Virginia Military Institute of all of all institutions. You know, it was which is a structured, uh, you know, uh, uh, military system. And uh, that's where I was uh, reading all this stuff. And and uh, another guy who was there with me at the same time, but I think at, like two years behind me, was a guy by the name of, of uh, Jacob Hornberger. Oh, wow. Um, so Jacob was not at that time a libertarian. And I was reading all this radical stuff. Uh, and, and my mind was literally spinning. I mean, it was just a... Uh, Ayn Rand and uh, read the, the uh, at, read Atlas Shrugged. At you the ever meet her? Pardon? Did you ever meet her? Never did. I never met her. I would like to have met her. What about Mencken from uh, Baltimore? Other journalists? No, but I, I did uh, go to a, a, a lecture given by um, uh, uh, Von Mises. No uh, way. At, at, wow. univers at University of Virginia. He was there. I think it was uh, Intercollegiate uh, Studies Institute, uh, 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 ISI. I, yeah, think, I think that, that, that was right. the one. Uh, that uh, was sponsoring him, and uh, and I I said I got to go to this. So I, I met uh, Carl Hess and and um, Murray Rothbard, and I didn't meet um, von Mises. I wish I'd had the guts to go up and see him afterwards. I, I wasn't able to. He would have called you a socialist. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, golly, uh, uh, Roy Childs uh, in in the early days, and. Uh, um, 
they were uh, oh another of my heroes uh, in the early days was uh, Harry Brown yeah. uh, uh, how I found freedom in a free world and, and yet he and Harry and Jacob Hornberger butted heads didn't they in they the early did. 2000s and, and you know I I think Jacob regrets that that tension um, I think he does yeah. um, J- Jacob's a great guy and and uh, uh, Harry Brown was a great guy. One of the the most exciting times in my entire life, I was uh, speaking at the Libertarian Party convention down in Atlanta some years ago, the National Convention, and Harry Brown was there too. And I was in a costume dressed as Richard Henry Lee, you know, doing a presentation at one of these things. And they had Harry to introduce me. Oh my gosh, that was, you know, one of my heroes (laughs) uh, uh, introducing me. And um, they put my wife Patty and I at the table with he and his wife to have dinner that night, and boy, I was in heaven. It was just uh, just a great thrill um, because uh, I'd read a, a, a lot of Harry's stuff. He was just uh, super insightful, just um, brilliant guy, and he was a, a, f- a friendly guy. I mm-hmm. mean, just just a, a gentleman. You know, he was just. Uh, very courteous, very uh, thoughtful, and uh, I really liked him a lot. Uh, I went to his um, his memorial service down in North Carolina when he passed away, and his I should have worn it today. His wife um, had, had laid out uh, on a table a number of his things for people who were there, and uh, some of his neckties were there. And she said, help yourself. You know, this is Harry. This was his part of his life, and I want you people of all to have these things, oh, wow. and and I should have worn Harry's uh, necktie, <laughs> which was he was a great communicator. Like he made oh, things. Talk about making things simple, yeah, right, for the average person. And, and that's the way I like to do things. I I, I would aspire to be, uh, you know, one percent as good as he was at making complicated ideas simple. That's what I want to do. I want to make simple um, statements about life that that everybody agrees with. I want agreement. Uh, I'm not looking for for tension and hostility and fighting. I, I want to. Did you ever wanna, experience a lot of that? Pardon? Did you ever experience a lot of that? Uh, arguing people, trying to. Well, you know, when I get to a point where, and, and, you know, a long time ago, and, I, and when I was younger, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I I enjoyed because uh, you the, said you were here in Richmond for a while, right? Yeah, um, and. Surely you've met other libertarians. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, now, I guess, what was that scene like here in Richmond? One of the things I always have, it's not a libertarian party till somebody yells, you're not a real libertarian. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, we had a group of, uh, of people here in Richmond that was, uh, they, we were pretty hardcore, you know. Uh, when uh, Milton Friedman uh, came out with his uh, Free to Choose series, um, we, it, it was on t- television and we would all gather, get together, uh, to watch it and, and, and so forth. And we, we thought that was really cool stuff. And, uh, we had a pretty, uh, radical group here in town. We, uh, uh, they, they created, uh, not, I wasn't in it, but some of the people created the Les Ender Spooner Jug Band. Wow. Are you familiar with that? that I've heard of the Whiskey Brigade. <laughs> <laughs> Same idea. <laughs> and we had, uh, that's how I kind of got to know Carl Hess because he, we brought him down as a speaker for a number of events and Roy Charles was here and, and we just had a, a wonderful time, uh, together. We've gone different ways, moved to different places. A couple of us are still in Richmond. Um, uh, uh, Jim Crow uh, with Crow with an E on the end of it. Uh, Jim is uh, uh, one of the uh, was one of the spark plugs in that group, and he's still in town. And uh, have you all met him uh, yet, by no. any chance? No. Oh, he's he's a a great guy. And mm. uh, anyway, yeah, we had a, a lively group. We had um, oh, what was it called? We uh, liked uh, the Austrian school. Of economics, of course, and and uh, when the boys' club here in town had an international festival where they were cooking food of different cultures and so forth, well, they had an Austrian group. Well, they, no, I take it back. They didn't have an Austrian group, and we said, "Well, damn, we're going to become Austrians." <laughs> and, and so, so we met some Austrian people. Um, a late one lady in particular. Um, who's who's alive and 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 uh, with us and, and a great lady and her husband uh, Howard Maxwell is, is gone now, but uh, he was just a great guy. They were kind of 
we wanted their help to teach us how to create, make Austrian food. Yeah. You know, like strudel and this, that, and the other. Cause we didn't do that stuff. Well, <laughs> well, they came in wanting to promote their Austrian culture and taught us how to make apple strudel from apples in an apple tree in my backyard. You know, we made this stuff and then we sold it at the boys club and had an Austrian booth. Well, they were, Amazed by, well, why are you interested in Austria? You know? <laughs> and and, and the, by the time it was all over, <laughs> they were hardcore uh, <laughs> Austrian school people. Also, wow. hardcore. I mean, it's infectious. If you really pay attention yeah. and, and listen to what's being said and think about human life uh, and human nature, it'll draw you in. Right. It's, you know, praxeology. I guess that's the way you pronounce it. All right. Then Ron Paul say we're all Austrians now. We're not Keynesians. <laughs> we're all Keynesians now. So, <laughs> but I want to give a shout out to uh, uh, a wonderful guy who's not with us anymore, uh, Howard Maxwell, uh, who was one who was uh, uh, one of the folks who was uh, helping us, and and he came to one of our cooking nights after he learned a little bit about who we were in a black cape, cape with a a, a, a little. Uh, uh, Chow's uh, plastic ball, rubber ball, all painted black, and, and he, he looked like an anarchist. Uh, oh. <laughs> he said, Am I dressed right for this gathering? <laughs> Throwing bombs, right? <laughs> uh, Howard was a classic, just a great guy. <laughs> well, I think it's great that I guess Richmond has uh, had a good history of libertarianism and groups coming together and being part of a connecting with that culture with you and keeping that. it going is the, is a hard thing yeah. with, with people in their their lives you know taking them different places and, and physically not being present anymore and 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 bringing you, you got to bring new younger people into the fold or, or things you know you can't handle it we we had a um um we had a uh, we we took the money that we made at the austrian booth of the boys club international festival and we bought Books like uh, Human Action, Socialism, you know, all the all the classics and so forth. And it was a library that was open to anybody who wanted to read about these things. And uh, it was called, oh gosh, they're going to hate me for not thinking of the name of this thing. Um, um, we call ourselves apes. What? <laughs> Austrian Philosophical <laughs> and Education Society. Yeah. Oh, there we go. That makes sense. <laughs> Huh. Uh, well, you know, the socialists thought we were, you know, rudimentary and this, this cavemen is, yeah. and didn't have any knowledge. Well, this is a time when, uh, I mean, no one knew about Austrian economics at no. that time. Like, we talk about it all the time. It's more in the general parlance, I think, today. Yeah, than, yeah. yeah. But there was virtually nobody who was interested in it. But, well, know, when we time. had our group here in town, we thought uh, it, it was pretty much an isolated feeling. Uh, we thought, you know, that... I heard that there's some libertarians meeting in New York City. They're like five people, and they get to the end. <laughs> you know, it was kind of like that. Uh, it, it it just wasn't part of the culture. Mm. You know, it it was alien. And whenever we had an opportunity to become a, a bit more, you know, well known in our ideas, such as when a, a libertarian would run for a, an office, at least it was being mentioned in the media once in a rare while. That was exciting to us. But to see it grow to the point where it is now, I mean, it, people may feel pessimistic, you know, in their lives today because of all the, the, the difficult things going on. But my gosh, it's so much better, uh, in the sense that it's a bigger movement now. There's much more vitality. There are new ideas. There are scholars that are coming up. You know, um, I remember I, I met with uh, Ron Paul in his office to talk about a book I was writing back in I don't know, 2007, 2008, around that time, mm. that exciting time. And he told me, he said, uh, look out for this young guy by the name of uh, Dr. Thomas Woods. He said, he's a sharp guy. He's going to be one of, he's going to be a spark plug in this movement. And yeah. so I paid more attention to Tom Woods after Ron Paul said, you know, this guy's yeah. worth listening to. So, um, yeah, uh, but that, that energy and that, that influx of, um, uh, of youth and new ideas, uh, we didn't feel very much of it back in those early days. It was, it was really kind of a frustrating 
pessimistic time in some ways, although we were excited about what we'd learned, you know. But, but yeah, you didn't have social media, you didn't have YouTube. Nah. Tom Woods got his start on YouTube just yeah. answering all of Ron Paul's detractors, you know. Yeah, so, oh, yeah. It, it, yeah, it, it was a different... Uh, it was a different story. I mean, you almost got to hand it to the objectivists, I guess, because they, like, before the internet and all that, they did have a fairly significant, you, you know, little movement. Yeah. So With written letters on network, they had to build the networks from the ground up. <clears throat> With the internet, it's easy to just kind of plug in and uh, have access to talking to people from all sorts of, you know, walks of life. Yeah, yeah, the all internet, over the world. The, the internet changed the world. I mean, it it it's opened it up. I mean, we have a chance. We have much better chance now than we ever did. I mean, getting uh, cracking through the the uh, the walls of of the media. I mean, when I was a kid, it was it it was uh, three channels, three networks: ABC, uh, NBC, and CBS. That's ba- and then public TV came in after that. But that was it. And and if you didn't break into that. I'll break through that that barrier. You didn't get anywhere. Right, right. I guess kind of like uh, I'm glad that these uh, colonials at Jamestown kept with the idea of private property <laughs> and kind of kept right. with that tradition and kept passing that torch. A lot of people like to say that we're a nation of immigrants. Like, you know, we're a nation of uh, Welsh and English settlers. There was no America here. <laughs> uh, they created America and these cultures and these traditions through failure and starvation and, and people dying and learning from their mistakes. Well, but, well they got addicted to uh, surviving and being happy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you, yeah. You can become addicted to that. Right, right. <laughs> uh, and I'm glad those ideas kept the torch running, even... In, Today, or 200 years later, or 300 years later, uh, people want to kind of snuff it out, uh, but it's still lit in many other people's hands, and kind of like uh, libertarians back then, keeping uh, these groups together and writing this stuff and connecting together, I'm sure that was a big boon to where we are today, and making sure that these kind of information is still being passed and more of it is being lit. Well, there are many ways of doing what we all want to do. I mean, there's no one solution. There's no one way. There are all kinds of ways. I've seen some of your interviews with people on the street, and, and I like uh, the, the the process that you use, which is asking them questions yeah. that lead them to answers that should help them. <laughs> you, know, right. you know, they're going to give you the answer. They're going to answer in whatever way they want to answer. But you know, uh, if they continue to struggle with with uh, contradictions in themselves to give answers to simple questions, they they may question their their perspective. And 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 that method that you use, I think, is is a wonderful way to do it. There, there are many ways. That, there are all kinds of ways. I um, sometimes uh, I dress up in a costume to be a character and, and do these presentations. And my presentations are provocative. Um, not in the sense that they're intended to make people angry. I don't do that. Um, but in the sense that I tell them things they didn't know and, and I shock them, uh, with certain revelations, um, that cause them to want to think and take the next step along. You know, I, I'm leading them by the hand. But when I, uh, portray John Rolfe and talk about the transition from the common storehouse to, uh, private property ownership for the common man. I, I don't use the word socialism. Mm-hmm. Uh, they didn't use it. Um, it. It would be counterproductive for me to say that. It, it, it's wrong to say that. It would be. It, it's not historically accurate to portray right. a character like that. Mm-hmm. I want to be. I want to be faithful to these people and and take the the positions that they took. I want to have the ignorance that they had. Uh, not only the knowledge they had, but I want the, the ignorance that they had about the world around them. And, um, that helps people to, um, today to understand, oh, I, I see why they did that now. I mean, it makes sense now. You know, I, I never understood history. It always seemed to be strange and bizarre and people do weird things. And that's, um, that's a, a result of not knowing the, the reasons behind. Why did the adults do what they do? Again, you, you don't have to agree with a person's values, but if you understand them, you understand why they're doing what they're doing. But, but getting back to your process, you help people question their own positions uh, by asking them questions, just and, simple things. Yeah. I think a lot of the questions I ask, uh, they haven't really 
considered what those answers are right. or define uh, some of these terms that they use on a daily basis. In a way, you're taking them by the hand and leading them All right. <laughs> into, into knowledge. You're not uh, taking a hammer and, and, and you know, whacking them. you got to believe this. You know, you, you're a fool. You're idiots. Uh, <laughs> I'm not a not, public school teacher. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's not an effective uh, uh, communications method anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, Aristotle, 2,500 years ago, um, wrote uh, rhetoric, and it's about how you make a persuasive argument. And it, it could, it's as valid today as it was 2,500 years ago. Um, he talks about the three things in particular, um, ethos, logos, and pathos. Uh, ethos is the reputation you have and, you know, why anybody's willing to listen to you in the first place, because you have a little bit of uh, credibility. Um, a, a logos is the logic of your argument, and uh, pathos is is appreciating, although not having to agree with, but appreciating your the person you're talking with values and perspectives. You you appreciate them, and you can you use the pathos yeah. in, in in your presentations or your questions, um, but. He was right. Those three things are fundamental to making any persuasive argument. And what we're doing in our work is making persuasive arguments, we hope. Is that the trivia method of critical thinking? The <laughs> grammar, logic, and rhetoric? This is what I've heard it described as. Uh, uh, I, I, I haven't, you know, I haven't heard it that way. I, All I, right. I should look, at, look that up. I don't know. Yeah. So this is, it's called the trivium method of critical thinking. And, uh, it's grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Grammar is the, the words you use that refers to the topic. Yeah. Logic is how the pieces fit together. Yeah. And rhetoric is how you, in your, in your own mind, tell it to yourself or teach it to somebody else. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I like the pathos idea because, um, people, when they listen to you, if they're sitting in your audience or if you're talking to them one on one, they're listening to to what you're saying as what's in this for me? <laughs> That's the way they do it. Yeah. That's the way we do it. That's the way we approach the world. What benefit does this have to me to to keep me alive and to make me happy? Right. How does this happen? There's nothing value? wrong with that. That's the way we live. But when you can when you know they're doing that then you can, you know, you can um, um, construct your argument in a more effective way. I think Cal's method is really good because it lets them come to the conclusion themselves Absolutely. versus giving them the conclusion. Absolutely. Because, you know, if you lay it out for them, they're going to be resistant to it. Yeah. <clears throat> I think it's it's interesting how, you know, when I think about socialism, I think it's always very clear what's in it for me. Like if somebody's trying to get me to buy into it, it's like, okay, well, they're free stuff, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so they've got pathos nailed, you know, this is the logos, you know, part of it. <laughs> One of the things I like to, uh, to say, to get people to, to think about government is I say, um, one of the, um, the three fundamental things that every government does um, and I don't, I don't care whether it's in Peru or China or the United States or, or anywhere else. They all do this. Number one, they threaten. A law or a regulation is a threat. Number two, they employ force. And the force is the law or regulation enforcement. And number three, they confiscate. That's what taxation is. Every single government that is a government uh, does those three things, more or less. Some do them do those things more, and some do them less. But um, um, force, uh, threats, force, and confiscation. In my view, I tell people I don't use those in my personal life. You know, I I, I haven't found that to be an effective way for me to accomplish my personal goals. And you know. <laughs> Uh, I, 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 that's me trying to make things simple. Right. Right. And they, right. government agents shouldn't get an exemption for morality. They should be held to the same morality, if not higher, if they want to rule over us. Yeah. yeah. Right. Bradford was talking about uh, the source of the evil that he came across before he changed it. And he point, pinpointed it to uh, Plato's attack on private property and pointing out Aristotle's uh, refutation of that. Um, 
I think it's interesting to note that I guess this is a uh, this charter the the company that was the Virginia company. Yeah, yeah. Uh, being a, a private affair, um, I think from being that they're able to change course fast, right? As like as a private entity, you can do that. Through a government entity, it, it takes you know twenty years red tape bureaucracy. Um, so I think it does kind of show that they come across a problem and they can try to rectify it and make it. Uh, and change this direction, of course. That's exactly right. Uh, they were uh, much uh, more able to do that with the um, uh, unfortunate uh, limitation of the physical distance of the Atlantic Ocean as a, a, a barrier to communication back and forth. Right. Um, uh, when something was learned at Jamestown, the word of that knowledge didn't get to the Virginia company to make a change and mm. make a decision about that and, and, until the a ship could make a, make right. a transit across the Atlantic. Right. That could be three months. Uh, it took then time to argue things and, and, and discuss things, uh, and then a decision might come back uh, three months later. So that's a half a year at, at very minimum, maybe seven months at very minimum. Right. To make changes, whereas uh, you, uh, we today are, are uh, familiar with just instantaneous communication. So uh, it would have been even faster All right. had, had they not had that limitation. All right. Absolutely. Um, well, I want to thank you so much for coming on uh, the Libertarian Crusaders. You've been uh, like a wealth of great, awesome knowledge in history and um, I'm glad you're still here in Richmond. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'm a Virginian by birth, and and uh, I, I love this place. I mean, I've been a lot of places in the world, and and I, I like a lot of places, Switzerland in particular. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I, I love this place, and uh, um, I think the the history of Virginia has all the things that we need to use as tools. Exactly. Uh, the, the, we don't need anything else. It's it's all here. Right. And history is our friend, not our enemy. But thank you very much for a chance to to uh, chat a little bit. And, and uh, I'm I'm very encouraged about what you guys are doing, and I appreciate it. I think we should probably have you for uh, Anarchon and do uh, a <laughs> talk next year. Um, so those listening, thank you uh, for watching and stay liberated. Get off my property. If they keep printing money, we'll keep printing guns. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.